just look at this thing. Seriously, it looks, well, it looks organic. Almost alien, right? It's a machine, but it's a machine of unbelievable power and complexity. It's built to work right at the very edge of what is physically possible. But you know, the most shocking thing about it isn't what it does. It's who, or maybe I should say what, created it. Because this engine, it was not designed by a human being. That's right. No engineer sat down with a blank screen and started sketching this. There was no big team of designers spending months or even years on blueprints. This entire, incredibly complex rocket engine was generated as a single solid piece by a computational model. It was, and this is the crazy part, it was literally computed into existence. Okay, so what makes this so special is the type of engine we're looking at. This is an aerospike. In the world of rocket science, this is basically the holy grail of propulsion. You see, unlike those traditional bell-shaped nozzles you're used to seeing on rockets, which are only really efficient at one specific altitude, an aerospike, in theory, maintains peak efficiency all the way from the ground to the vacuum of space. The problem? Well, for decades, they've been considered almost impossible to build, and it all comes down to one very, very fiery reason. 3,500 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature of the exhaust gas blasting right around that central spike. I mean, that is hot enough to melt literally any metal we know of. So to even survive, that spike has to be internally cooled with cryogenic propellants, which is an engineering nightmare so difficult that even with all its advantages, the aerospike has pretty much just been a dream for over 50 years. So that brings us to the big question, doesn't it? How did a tiny two-person company solve a problem that has stumped the entire aerospace industry for half a century? And how did they do it in just a few weeks? Well, the answer reveals this fundamental secret, a kind of bottleneck that's been quietly holding back all of modern engineering. To really get their breakthrough, we first have to understand the trap everyone else has been in. Right, so to understand this breakthrough, we first have to dig into the bottleneck. You see, for the last 40 years, engineering has been stuck trapped by a tool that promised to be a revolution, but instead it, well, it quietly slowed everything down to a crawl. And the villain of our story is CAD, or computer-aided design. I love this quote from co-founder Lynn Kaiser. He says, CAD is just a high-tech sketch pad. It helps you draw something, but it has no idea why you're drawing it that way. All the physics, all the logic, all the real engineering intent, that stays locked up inside the engineer's head. So if you need to make a change, even a small one, you pretty much have to start all over, manually redrawing everything. This slide just nails the difference. On the left, you've got the old way, cat. It's like being a scribe in the Middle Ages, painstakingly copying a book by hand. One mistake, and you're starting the whole page over. But on the right, that's the new way, computational engineering. This is like having the author's original file on a word processor. You're not just changing the letters, you're changing the source code itself. So instead of a static blueprint, you have a dynamic recipe, like a strand of engineering DNA that can generate countless variations in minutes. And this right here is the fundamental shift in thinking. For decades, we started with the shape, the geometry, and then we tried to make the physics work. With this new way of doing things, you start with the physics, with the rules, with the requirements. The physical shape of the object, that's just the final output of the entire logical process. It's completely flipped. So who are the masterminds behind this new paradigm? How on earth did they manage to encode the very DNA of engineering into a machine? Let me introduce you to Leap 71. And get this, it's a team of just two people. You've got Josephine Listener, an aerospace engineer who worked on Lewis Hamilton's championship winning Formula One car, so she knows a thing or two about performance. And then you have Lynn Kaser, a veteran software engineer. This fusion of deep physical engineering and brilliant software architecture, that's the secret sauce. Their goal wasn't just to build a better rocket, it was to build the machine that builds the rockets. And this is their creation, Neuron. Now, it's not an AI in the way you might be thinking, like ChatGPT or something. It's what's called a computational model. It understands the fundamental rules of the universe, physics, chemistry, and it uses those rules to generate functional hardware from the ground up. Here's the best way to think about it. Imagine you're an alien, and I want to teach you how to light a match. A traditional AI would show you millions of videos of people striking matches. Eventually, you'd learn to copy the motion, but you'd never really know why it works. Neuron's approach is totally different. It would teach you about wood, about phosphorus, about friction, heat, and combustion. 
And from that basic knowledge, you could figure out how to light the match all by yourself, even if you'd never seen anyone do it. That's the huge difference between just imitating something and truly understanding it. And because Neuron is built on this foundation of rules, not just looking at past examples, it's unbelievably powerful. It doesn't just design a single engine. It actually creates the source code for an entire family of engines. So any improvement, any tiny lesson learned from a real-world test gets fed right back into that core algorithm. And that means every single engine it designs from that moment on is automatically better. It's like an exponential learning curve baked right into the design process itself. But of course, code is just code, right? A computer model is just a simulation. The real question, the only question that matters, is does it actually work in the real world? Could this object, computed into existence, actually survive a brutal trial by fire? Well, it was time to find out. So here are the specs for the big test. The engine runs on liquid oxygen and kerosene. Yep, the same stuff that powered the legendary Saturn V moon rocket. The cooling system is incredibly clever, using both the freezing cold oxygen and the kerosene to keep different parts of the engine from vaporizing. And the whole thing was 3D printed out of a special copper alloy as one single solid part. No welds, no bolts, just one continuous piece of metal. Okay, now here is the part that just blows my mind. The entire process, from locking in the final design to having a fully manufactured engine sitting on the test stand, took just a few weeks. A task that normally requires massive teams of people and years of development was done in less than a month. Let's just walk through those final moments. Weeks before, Neuron generates the code. Then a 3D printer runs for just 62 hours, and poof, the physical object exists. The amazing team at the University of Sheffield gets it all prepped, and then on December 18th, ignition. A perfect, successful hot fire on the very first try. The impossible engine, the one computed into existence, just roared to life. A successful test is one thing, that's fantastic. But the implications of how it succeeded, that's what's about to change not just aerospace, but pretty much how we build everything. During the test, you could see the flame burned a little bit green. Now, that's the telltale sign of burning copper, which means a tiny part of the spike wasn't being cooled perfectly and was actually becoming part of the fuel. In a traditional project, that's a setback. You've got to go back to the drawing board. But here, it's a gift. That data gets fed straight back into Neuron, the algorithm gets updated, and now every single future engine generated by that system will be better. Failures literally become guaranteed improvements. And this is not just for rockets, not at all. Leap71 has already used Neuron to design a huge range of super complex hardware. The same core principles that can figure out how to route cryogenic fuel through a rocket nozzle can also be applied to designing super efficient heat exchangers, electric motors, or even bioprinted vascular systems for human tissue. The fundamental DNA is universal. And the real world impact of this is just huge. As Josephine Lisner points out, Building a new rocket engine is often the biggest, most expensive bottleneck in space exploration. It's so hard that every company has to basically reinvent the wheel. But by turning engine design into a software problem, Leap71 can essentially productize it. They can sell the recipe. And that breaks the bottleneck wide open for countless new companies to get into the space industry, which could just radically accelerate innovation. And this all brings us to a really profound final thought. We are leaving the age of drawing things and entering the age of computing physical objects. We're moving from being digital sketch artists to being architects of algorithmic DNA. So the question isn't just about what they will build next. The real question is, in a world where complexity is no longer the barrier, what will we build?